Looking for magic cards? At flipsidegaming.com you can now use the promo code LVD to get a 10% discount on orders over $10 while supporting the channel at the same time. Hello and welcome to another Magic Arena upgrade guide video. Today we're taking a look at the Azure Skies deck, which is the mono blue flying deck. First off, we'll take a look at the deck list and play a game with the deck without making any changes to it. And then afterwards, we'll gradually upgrade the deck. First off, using all the free cards we get from the Mastery Tree. And then afterwards, also using the cards we get from the different two color guild decks. And then once we're done upgrading the deck for free, we'll start using some wild cards to further upgrade the deck. And then we'll play some games with the fully upgraded deck as well. So let's dive right into it here with Azure Skies, a mono blue flyer deck. And we've got a few payoffs for playing all these flying creatures. One of them is a Warden, 3 mana 2 to flyer, making creature spells with flying we cast cost 1 generic mana less to cast. And the other payoff is a Windstorm Drake, giving our flying creatures 1 additional power. Then taking a look at the rest of the deck at 1 mana, we've got 2 copies of Spectral Sailor, nice 1 mana 1 1 flyer with flash that we can play at instant speed. And for 4 mana we can also draw a card, so nice a mana sink for the late game. Then we also have the full playset of a Wall of Runes. While we're busy attacking the opponent in the air with our flyers, we do need something to hold the ground so we don't get outraced. And the Wall of Runes does exactly that. One mana 0-4 Defender that can hold the ground. And it also lets us scry one when it enters the battlefield, giving us a nice bit of card selection. And then the main interaction we have in the deck are these four copies of Unsummon, which can return target creature to its owner's hand at instant speed for just a single blue mana. So pretty effective uh, interaction for the opponent's creatures. Then at 2 mana, we don't have much. We've got one Brineborn Cutthroat, which is a 2 mana 2 1 flash that we can, of course, play at instant speed. And then whenever we cast a spell during an opponent's turn, we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on the Cutthroat, so it plays nicely alongside other instant speed spells, like the Unsummon, for example. Then we also have three copies of Sky Theater Strix, which is a 2 mana 1 2 flyer that says whenever we cast a non creature spell, the Strix gets one additional power until end of turn, so it plays well with our instants and sorceries. Then at 3 mana we've got a ton of cards. Cloudkin Seer is great as a 3 mana 2 1 flyer that draws a card when it enters the battlefield. Then we've got Frost Links that can tap an opposing creature down for a turn and is a 2 2 itself. We've got a Leapfrog as a 3 1 that can gain flying if we cast an instant or sorcery spell this turn. We've got the Warden of course. And then 4 copies of Winged Words which costs 1 generic mana less to cast if we control a creature with flying. So that's another payoff card for playing all these flyers and lets us draw 2 cards. And drawing 2 cards for 2 mana is a pretty efficient rate. So if we can get a cheap flyer in play first then the Winged Words is quite good. Then at 4 mana we've got a Dungeon Geists as a nice removal spell slash creature. 4 mana for a 3-3 flyer and when it enters the battlefield we can tap down an opposing creature and that creature is not going to untap for as long as the Geist is around. So very similar to the Frost Links but we'll keep it tapped down permanently. And then at 5 mana we've got our 2 copies of Windstorm Drake and 2 Air Elementals as a 5 mana 4-4 flyer, so pretty big. And then to top off our curve, we've got one Riddle Master Sphinx as a 6 mana 5 5 flyer. And when it enters the battlefield, it gets to bounce an opposing creature, similar to Unsummon. And then we also have a Mirror Golem as a 7 mana 3 3 that can destroy any non land permanent and opponent controls when it enters the battlefield. And then our mana base is very straightforward 25 basic islands. So that's our deck. Now let's jump into a game and see what our deck does. Alright, we're on the draw with a pretty decent looking hand. A good curve of uh, spells we can play in the early game. And then the Drake that can potentially cost 4 mana thanks to the Warden facing turn 1 Pelt Collector. And the wall lines up pretty well here. Can soak up a bit of damage. A Riddle Master, I think I'll have to bottom since we're pretty far off casting that. Even with the Warden it's going to cost 5. So we probably need to draw some lands first. A red green, so this is a Gruul aggro deck. Don't mind blocking, even if they do have some sort of trick. Could be Collision Colossus here, for example, to trample over my wall. Yep. Now I don't mind trading my Cutthroat for the Pelt Collector, since the Pelt Collector threatens to become a lot bigger over time. Tomri is also pretty good. Could keep the cutthroat to try and pressure Domri. So this is a tough choice. I think I'm just gonna go for the trade here. The risk now of course is that if I play Warden, 
My opponent can play a big creature and then fights to kill my Warden with Domri. So they potentially have 5 mana if they use Domri for mana as well here. Bonecrusher Giants can take out Warden and then my opponent can still cast the 3 mana 4-3 that gets pumped by Domri's passive. So it's not looking good. Unsummoning the Giants doesn't feel great. And the Windstorm Drake is just not going to be very impactful without any flyers in play. So let's play our Windstorm Drake. Which is probably forced to trade off for the Giant, given the chance. Although Domri's Ambush is going to prevent that. Does deal 2 to my opponent, since the ability is also symmetrical here. Well, I'm one land away from casting my Meteor Golem, which can maybe take out the Giants. What I could also do is block with my wall and then unsummon my wall so it doesn't die and I get another chance at uh, playing it and blocking. Winged Words, I kind of want to keep on top just to draw two here. It's possible I just need to desperately look for that land so I can play Golem next turn. But I'm also running out of uh, action, so having that Winged Words to draw two could be more useful. Opponent might just fight a wall with Domri to hit me for six right away. Instead decides to attack. The problem with Bouncing Giant is that my opponent gets to shock and replay Giant right away here. So I might be better off chum blocking. So let's cast the Winged Words. So if I cast another Winged Words, I would be dead on board unless I can draw into another island so I can unsummon the Giant. I think that's a risk I'm willing to take since we're pretty far behind. Alright, there's a land. So if my opponent attacks, I'll unsummon the Giant so I don't die. And then next turn I could Meteor Golem to take it out. Alright, it's going to be an Amber Cleave on the Pelt Collector, which is just enough to kill me here. The Double Strike and Trample granting equipment. Alright, so we definitely hung in there for a while, but eventually the Gruul deck was able to overpower us. Alright, now that we got to see the deck in action, it's time to upgrade the deck. And we'll start with all the upgrades we can get through the Account Mastery Tree, which you get with a new account. And the first upgrade is called the Path of Perfection upgrade, which gives you a fourth copy of Cloudkin Seer. And that will automatically suggest to cut one copy of Frostlings if you accept the game's suggestion. So we'll make that same swap here. So we'll add one Cloudkin Seer and cut one Frostlings from the deck. Next up, if we follow the account mastery tree and unlock one mastery orb, we could get the high altitude upgrade, which introduces two additional copies of Windstorm Drake. So we'll add those as well here. And we also unlock one extra copy of a warden. So we get up to four copies there as well, the two payoff cards for playing all these flyers. So that's definitely a nice addition. And to make room for these three cards, the game automatically suggests to cut one more copy of Frostlings. And the game also recommends to cut two copies of a Leapfrog, which we will do as well. Next up, if we keep following the account mastery tree, we can also get the Confiscation upgrade, which introduces one copy of a Verity Circle to the deck, which is a rare enchantment that says whenever a creature an opponent controls becomes tapped, if it isn't being declared as an attacker, we can draw a card. And for 5 mana, we can tap target creature without flying an opponent controls, so we can also draw the card with the ability. So it has a bit of synergy with cards like Dungeon Guys. We did just cut two copies of Frostlings from the deck, which did synergize with the Verity Circle, but uh, we'll add it to the deck for now. But this is definitely one of the first cards that we will end up cutting as soon as we start making our own upgrades. But the two more exciting additions from the Confiscation upgrade are a second copy of Dungeon Guys, which is great, 
and then also an extra copy of a Brineborn Cutthroat. Go up to two copies there as well. And then to make room for these cards, the game suggests to cut the three copies of Sky Theater Strix. So we will follow these instructions as well. Next up we get to the Intellectual Superiority upgrade, which contains one copy of Negates, the two mana counterspell for non-creature spells. Next up we also get one copy of Mass Manipulation, which is a very powerful card if we have a lot of mana. So at least six mana before X equals one, and we can steal one opposing creature or planeswalker, and then eight mana before we can steal two things. So this is pretty expensive in a deck that generally wants to be pretty aggressive. But of course, if we can pull it off, it can be a game-winning play. So we get one of those, and then we also get a second copy of a Riddle Master Sphinx as another powerful curve-topping flyer that can bounce an opposing creature. And then to make room for these cards, the game automatically suggests to cut three copies of Unsummon, which is a little bit questionable since we're adding some expensive cards like Mass Manipulation and Sphinx, and we're cutting some of our only cheap interaction, but I'll keep following the game's suggestions here and cut three and summons. So this is where we end up if we follow the upgrades from the account mastery tree, so we haven't had to use any wild cards yet. And next up we can keep upgrading the deck for free by using some of the cards we can find in the two color guild decks. And the first guild that can give us some new cards is the Azorius guild, which is blue-white. And in the Azorius deck we find two copies of Arrestor's Admonition, which is a nice three mana instant speed bound spell, similar to Unsummon but it has addendum. If we cast a spell during our main phase, we also get to draw a card. So it has a few similarities with the Fairy Time Raveler, but of course doesn't leave behind the Planeswalker. So we'll add two copies of Arrestor's Admonition. This will also help fill the void left behind by Unsummon. Then we also get to add one copy of Precognitive Perception, which is a nice five mana draw spell that lets us draw three cards at instant speed. And it also has addendum. If we cast this spell during our main phase, we get to scry three before drawing three cards, which is a nice upgrade. So we'll add one precognitive perception. And then finally, we also get to add one copy of Warrant Warden, which is one of those split cards. And we're only really interested in the Warrant half of the card, which for double blue can put target attacking or blocking creature on top of its owner's library at instant speed. You could add some blue eye dual lands to help you cast Warden, but just the Warrant half of the card is pretty nice as well. So we'll add that to the deck. And then to make room for these four new cards, we're going to cut the Meter Golem, which is a bit expensive at seven mana. I also don't mind cutting the Mass Manipulation while powerful. It's uh, pretty difficult to pull off a big mass manipulation in this deck since we're not very good at getting to the late game in the first place as we lack the needed interaction or ramp. And then I also don't mind cutting the Verity Circle which is a bit clunky and uh, it's kind of difficult to trigger the Verity Circle without using the ability since we only have the two dungeon guys that really synergize with it and it also doesn't tap down flyers which given that most of our creatures fly are the biggest uh, potential problems from the opponent as we would like to tap down bigger flyers from the opponent like maybe a big hydroid crisis for example so the circle doesn't help us there either so I'll cut the circle and now that we've got some pretty mana intensive cards like the manipulation which can cost at least six mana the mirror golem at seven and even the verity circle costing five mana to be used is pretty mana intensive we can get away with cutting an island and going back down to 24. Then we get to Demir, the blue-black guild, which gives us two copies of a Night Veil Sprite, a two mana 1-2 flyer, that whenever it attacks lets us surveil one, which is very similar to Scry 1, giving us a bit of card selection, so we make sure we can keep hitting our land drops, and in the late game we can put those lands in the graveyard instead of flooding out. So we'll add two Night Veil Sprites. And to make room for the two Night Veil Sprites, I don't mind cutting the two Brineborn Cutthroats at two mana as well, since while we do have a few instants that can synergize with the Cutthroat, we're not like a blue-green flash deck playing a bunch of instant speed flash creatures and counter spells to synergize with it. For the most part, we're tapping out in our own turn, so the Cutthroat's not going to accumulate a lot of plus one plus one counters, and a two mana two one is not too impressive, so those two can go. And this will also conclude all the upgrades we can find in the two color guild decks, since in the Izzet deck there's nothing really worth adding. You could consider Murmuring Mystic, as it does make some 1 1 flyers whenever we cast an instant or sorcery, but we don't really have enough instants and sorceries to really make the Mystic worth it. And then in the blue green deck, the Simic deck, we also don't really find anything worth adding to the deck. So here is where we end up if we upgrade the deck using the account Mastery Tree upgrades as well as the cards we can find in the two color guilds. 
and then from here we can further upgrade the deck using some wild cards. We will start with all the commons we can add to the deck, followed by all the uncommons, the rares and the mythic rares, and we'll also try and go in order of importance if there's multiple cards and a certain rarity, so you can maybe prioritize certain cards if you lack the wild cards to get all of them at once. So at common, the only card we're really interested in adding to the deck is going to be the Fairy Miscreant. So this is not the most impressive one drop ever, but it is a 1 mana 1 1 flyer that will occasionally draw a card when it enters the battlefield if we control another copy of Fairy Miscreant. And our deck can potentially draw quite a few cards between cards like Winged Words and Cloud Seer. So it's not impossible to end up with multiple fairy miscreants, and if this does draw a card upon entering the battlefield, it's actually pretty decent, since our deck does want to find a lot of cheap flyers to then benefit from cards like Windstorm Drake and other various anthem effects. And uh, miscreant also makes it so we can more reliably cast a wing towards on turn two, since right now our deck doesn't really do much on turn two, other than maybe playing one of our other one drops. But now with four additional copies of Fairy Miscreant, the curve of turn one Miscreant into turn two Winged Words becomes a lot more realistic, and that will help us with our two-drop situation as well. So we'll add four Miscreants to the deck, and to make room for the four Fairy Miscreants, we will end up cutting all four copies of Wall of Runes. Now Wall of Runes is not a bad card in this deck, since sometimes we run into an opposing aggro deck, and we need to make sure to have that early blocker to stay alive long enough to deploy our other flyers, and in that case, the Wall of Runes could be quite serviceable. But some of the aggro decks in this format, like the Rat Cavalcade deck, do still get in a lot of damage, even if we do have an O4 blocker out. So in that case, we're sometimes better off just playing the Fairy Miscreant and trading it off for the opponent's one drops, so they can't keep uh, hitting us with the Cavalcade in play. And uh, against other decks that don't try and pressure our life total as much, we would much rather have the extra evasive flyer at one mana, and the Wall of Runes doesn't really accomplish a whole lot. Imagine playing against the Field of the Dead deck, for example. They don't really do much in the early turns, so Wall of Runes wouldn't be very helpful. And then once they do win the game, they usually win the game with an army of zombie tokens, and then the Wall of Runes is not really going to make the difference. And we're just better off being more proactive ourselves and try to kill the opponent. So we will cut the four Wall of Runes. Then we can add some uncommons to the deck, and a nice one from Throne of Eldrain is Hypnotic Sprite, which is a 2 mana for a 2-1 flyer, but it also has an adventure at instant speed called Mesmeric Glare, which for 3 mana can counter target spell with convert mana cost 3 or less, so it can be a nice bit of disruption. And of course we can always just cast a sprite on turn 2, but if we do decide to use the adventure first, then the creature will end up in exile, in adventure land if you will, and then we can still play the creature half of the card afterwards, if the adventure successfully resolved, so we can get a bit of additional value, which is always nice. So we'll add all four hypnotic sprites to the deck. And next up we can also add four copies of Heraldic Banner, which also rewards us for sticking to mono blue. As it enters the battlefield we choose a color, which in our case is going to be blue, and then all our blue creatures get plus one plus zero. Oh. So a very nice anthem effect, very similar to what we get from Windstorm Drake. But the upside of Heraldic Banner is that it doesn't die if our opponent plays a sweeper effect, for example, and still leaves us with a nice anthem effect for all the future creatures we might end up playing. And our deck can be quite soft to those sweeper effects, since we're just playing a whole bunch of creatures that will end up dying if our opponent decides to wipe the board. So having something stick around like the Heraldic Banner is quite useful. And then of course the banner also taps to add one blue mana to our mana pool, which can help us ramp, can help us double spell more easily. In the late game we can spend that mana on activating Spectral Sailor, so we still get some good use out of it. And another nice thing about banner is that we can tap it for blue mana the same turn that we play it. So turn 3 we can play banner, and then run out an extra Fairy Miscreant or Spectral Sailor, so we can be pretty mana efficient. And then in the later turns this also helps us double spell. Let's say on turn 5 we can play banner and then still play another 3 drop in the same turn and uh, use up every bit of mana we have. So we'll add four banners. And then the two last uncommons will be two additional copies of Spectral Sailor to complete our playset as a nice mana sink for late game. Good synergy with Heraldic Banner, as it will just be a 2-1 flyer for one mana, which is pretty powerful. And then also the extra mana from Banner can uh, be sunk into the ability from Sailor in the late game to draw some more cards. So we'll add two more Spectral Sailors. And then of course uh, the banner tapping for blue mana lets us play banner into a sailor on the same turn, which is also pretty synergistic. Now that we've added 10 uncommons, we gotta make some cuts as well. We'll cut to negate since we now have hypnotic sprite as an extra counter spell, so the negate is less necessary, even though there will be situations where negate will be better. 
Now that we have a full playset of Spectral Sailor to draw cards in the late game, we don't need the card draw from the Perception as much, so that one can go. Then we can also cut the two Aerial Mantles. While a 4-4 Flyer is big, 5 mana is pretty pricey for it, even with a Warden making it cheaper. And now that we've kind of shifted the focus to a lower curve and Heraldic Banner, it kind of benefits us to play lots of cheap blue flyers instead of playing a couple very big flyers, since then the effect from Banner kind of goes to waste, making this into a 5-4 is a lot less impactful than turning lots of these 1-1 flyers into 2-1 flyers, so I don't mind cutting the Aral Mantle. And kind of following the same logic, I also don't mind cutting the Windstorm Drake. While it does reward us for playing flyers, 5 mana is pretty expensive for this type of effect, and it does get wrecked by opposing sweeper effects, whereas the Heraldic Banner is a much safer investment. And as our last two cuts, I don't mind cutting the Night Veil Sprite, since now we have a lot more going on in the early turns between the Miscreants, the Sailors, and the added Hypnotic Sprites. And in the late game, we can still make use of extra lands if we have Sailor to activate and draw more cards. So the Surveil 1 also loses a little bit of value, since lands can still be fine top decks in the late game. Now it's time to move on to our rares, and we don't have a ton of rares to add to the deck, but we will add two more copies of Dungeon Guys as just a nice interactive flying creature that uh, is pretty important sometimes if we need to lock down an opposing Hydroid Crisis, for example, that would otherwise block all our flying creatures and just gives us a bit more interaction that our deck sometimes needs against opposing creature decks, especially green decks sometimes can still outrace us on the ground, and the guys being both a threat and a removal spell in one will uh, be quite powerful. So we'll add two copies of Dungeon Geists. And then the next rare we will add is a lot less important, and you could easily go without it. It's just going to be a small improvement to our mana base, two copies of Castle Ventress, which uh, comes into play untapped as long as we control an island, which should not be an issue. And then in a late game we can pay for mana, tap the castle to scry two, so it can help us dig towards more action, perhaps if we don't have a Spectral Sailor providing extra cards instead. So it's a pretty low opportunity cost to add castle if you have it. And we'll of course cut two islands to make room for the castles. And to make room for the dungeon guys, I don't mind cutting the Riddle Master Sphinx, while it is powerful, it is also expensive at 6 mana, and the Geist does something very similar at a much lower cost, so the Sphinx can go. So that's it for all the rares, now it's time to add a couple Mythics to the deck, and there's one playset of a very powerful card that fits perfectly into this deck, which is Brazen Borrower, 3 mana for a 3-1 Flash Flying, that can only block opposing creatures with flying, but it also has an Adventure, Petty Theft, 2 mana for an instant, that lets us return target a non-land permanent an opponent controls to its owner's hand, so it gives us that much needed early interaction with the adventure, and then later also gives us a 3-1 flash, which also plays quite well with the addition of Hypnotic Sprite, so if we have 3 mana and have a borrower in adventure land, we can kind of disguise the Hypnotic Sprite a little bit, since our opponent might expect us to just flash in the borrower, but instead we might be able to counter something with the Hypnotic Sprite. And having more creatures to play at instant speed also just helps us avoid running into a sweeper effect, as we'll still be able to flash in the borrower end of turn to keep up the pressure. So just a very powerful card overall. And we're happy to have all four. And to make room for the borrower we can kind of cut some of the other bounce effects that we still had in the deck. So the final unsummon can go, we can cut the two Arrester's Admonitions, and we can shave the Warrant Warden. And looking at our final deck list, our curve does look a little bit clunky, but in reality Winged Words often only cost 2 mana, and we're usually casting it after we're done deploying more creatures first. So we could kind of move the Winged Words in the 2 mana slot, and the Brazen Boar we're, we're also usually looking to use the Adventure first at 2 mana, before we're gonna cast a 3 mana 3-1 flash, so that also makes the curve look a little bit better. And then of course Warden, making our flyers cheaper, means that we can often cast uh, Dungeon Guys, Cloudkin Seers and Brazen Borrowers at a discount, so we can empty our hand faster and then maybe refuel with a Winged Words or a Spectral Sailor. So yeah, that uh, basically rounds out the deck, now it's time to add some personal touches to the deck. can change the picture to, let's say, the Warden, can change our card sleeve to the one you like, we'll go with the Eldraine sleeve, and then maybe change the basic land art, if you'd like. And I'm a fan of the unhinged full art lands that I unlocked a while back, so I'll be using those. And then we can also change the name if we want to, Azure Skies version 2. Alright, so that's the deck, now let's jump into some games and see how the deck does. Alright, we're on the play with uh, reasonable hands. We've got the turn 1 Sailor, couple petty thefts for interaction, and then the Warden can make the Boar Wars a bit cheaper too. 
Alright, another blue deck. They might have their own Spectral Sailor. Don't really mind trading since we just picked up another one. Or I could just bounce it with the Borrower in case my opponent just keeps up mana and doesn't play anything at sorcery speed, which is pretty likely if they're on the blue-green flash deck. But I also kind of want to trade so the Borrower can attack instead of trading for their Sailor. Kind of an interesting decision here. And then end of turn I might just play another one. Alright, Simic Guild Gates, so they are on Simic, could be Simic Flash. Looks like they might have another Sailor themselves. Nah, just an Opt. Fair enough. So in my turn, probably gonna play the Warden. Now, sadly, we don't get a discount for the adventure half of the card with the Warden, only the creature half. Another tap lands from my opponents, and now I get to keep up the adventure from Hypnotic Sprite as well, which is nice. Otherwise, I would have played the Fairy Miscreant. And after an opt, I could counter, but I think I'll wait. And of course, if I don't need to counter anything, I can just flash in the borrower as a 3-1. So it can be pretty picky with the Hypnotic Sprite's counter spell. And summon, I don't mind countering. So now we gotta watch out for potential Frilled Mystics or Nightback Ambushers. Which we can handle with the Brazen Borrower's Petty Theft at least. I should probably go full control since my opponent can flash in potential blockers. As we see another Spectral Sailor, now with that one I'm probably okay trading. Since again it also blocks my Brazen Borrowers. And I'm not gonna be using the Sailor's ability anytime soon. Now I could play the Sprite and then still have both halves of the Borrower at the ready. Although that does potentially run into an opposing counter spell, which we don't have to play into. I can just play my uh, Flash Creatures end of turn to circumvent that. And we're the ones that have the board presence. So let's see if this resolves. It does get countered by the Frilled Mystic. I'll just flash in another one. And now in my turn I get to resolve whatever I want. I will be empty-handed, my opponent still has a lot of action in hand. But yeah, they have to scoop it up since they know that they're gonna eventually lose to my Air Force. Sweet, on to the next one. Alright, we're on the play with uh, reasonable looking hands. No one drop sadly, but uh, do have some options at two. And at uh, 3 mana we'll have a lot of choices as well. Facing a turn 1 Knight of Avalon Legion, so an aggressive black deck. Yeah, I think I'm okay just using the Petty Thefts on the Knight end of turn. And then next turn I have the option of both Sprites or Borrower at instant speed. And I want to end of turn the Borrower, so they don't get the chance to replay the Knight this turn. They did have another one, though. But I might be able to counter knights with the sprite on the way down. And then the other one I can maybe lock down with the dungeon guys, we'll see. If my opponent's play is just to pump the Knight of Emma Legion, then... I can just flash in the Brazen Borrower instead. Well, Spawn of Mayhem is a 4-drop, so I can actually counter it with Hypnotic Sprite, so that's unfortunate. But 
but I can lock it down with the Dungeon Geists, which is probably necessary here. Otherwise I don't really get to attack or make any other progress. So now we're just trying to raise Knight of Abel Legion on the ground, which may or may not work out. Alright, it's gonna be Rankle, Master of Pranks, which uh, is pretty good here since they can force me to sacrifice a creature, which if they can just sacrifice Spawn of Mayhem, which doesn't cost them much, but then I can just sacrifice a Brazen Borrower instead. So I think I gotta take it. And once the Spawn of Mayhem gets sacrificed, of course I can afford to lose the Dungeon Geists. Opponent's making me discard. It's either the Cloud Seer or the Winged Words, I think. And I think I'll ditch the Winged Words. Sacrifice a Borrower. The Knight also grows. Three from Rankle, one from the Spawn of Mayhem. Warden is almost useful. Doesn't give me a discount on the Sprite, sadly. So as much as I would like to counter this Knight of Evil Legion, I think I'm forced to kind of tap out here, otherwise my opponent can decide to just pump Knight instead, and uh, then I'm not really making any progress. And Hypnotic Sprite could trade for Rankle, so I think I'm okay attacking with the uh, Dungeon Geists. And next turn I could go Warden plus Cloudkin Seer. So yeah, let's trade for Rankle. Another Knight. And a Rotting Regisaur. Alright, so now I'm hoping to draw into another Dungeon Geists to keep that locked down. Otherwise I might just uh, be dead. So I could still go for my plan of Warden into Cloudkin. And then I'll be forced to chumblock the Regisaur. I guess that's okay. Could potentially draw something useful. Eh, can almost cast another Cloudkin here, but... Uh, one mana short. So Cloudkin can jump in front of Regisaur. And yeah, it's gonna be close. If I had drawn one of my one mana flyers, I might have had lethal here. Could also double block the Regisaur, but I think I want to keep some amount of pressure here to hope to race my opponents. Can hit them for seven if they don't have any removal. If I draw another banner, I could kill them. So that's another reason not to double block. Another option I had was putting Warden on the 1 2 Knight and Cloudkin on the 2 3 Knight. And then they would have been forced to pump the knight to save it, and the other one would have traded, but then I take seven, and I lose two of my creatures, which is not ideal. Alright, second Rotting Registrar, so I think my only out at this point is to draw into another banner. I didn't have enough mana to scry with castle and then play banner, otherwise that would have maybe looked at an additional card as opposed to drawing with a Cloudkin. So banner or bust. Alright, islands, so I think that's a bust. At 9 life I have to chump both Regisaurs. I guess I'm technically not dead, the dungeon guys could still get there in two turns. But if my opponent has a single spot removal spell, I'm still dead. Now I could put a stop on upkeep if I want to scry with the castle. But yeah, it basically boils down to our opponent top decking removal here. And yeah, Murder Strider is uh, the perfect top deck here. Kills a Warden. And my opponent gets to attack for lethal. So it looked pretty bad, but we actually had a pretty decent chance of winning before my opponent top decked uh, their Murder Strider down to two life. So yeah, couldn't be any closer. All right, on to the next one. Alright, on the draw with a reasonable hand, a couple one drops, winged words to draw more cards. And hopefully hit our land drops. 
Opponent on turn one island and secret keepers, or opponents on mill. Fair enough. So our flyers should match up quite well against some of the mill creatures, like the secret keeper, maybe the wall of lost thoughts. But uh, turn two drowned secrets can definitely speed up the mill from the opponent quite a bit. And we don't have the fastest hand, no banner to pump our team. Could of course just bounce the uh, drowned secrets, which would be fine too. Yeah, I think I'll do that. It's gonna slow down the opponent a little bit. The alternative, drawing two with the winged words. Not too interesting when I already have a third land lined up here. Alright, they are playing black as well. So, mills me for two. Another castle. So I could main phase the borrower if I wanted to play around one of their three mana counter spells, like didn't say please. Which uh, is reasonable. And then next turn I could maybe Petty Theft plus Winged Words, we'll see. The downside of course of running out Borrower in our uh, own turn is that we could now potentially lose both creatures to a Sweeper effect. Opponent says go. I'll start by attacking, even if I Winged Words into a banner I wouldn't be able to play it. So I still only have 6 cards in my graveyard, so they can't play an Into the Story for 4 mana. So they're likely hanging on to a counter spell, in which case I think I'm just going to pass a turn here and then I can maybe end of turn play Borrower plus a Spectral Sailor. Another untapped Watery Grave and a Drown in the Lock to kill the Borrower. So yeah, they're likely hanging on to some sort of uh, three mana counter spell. I'll play the Spectral Sailor first, kind of to use it as bait. Alright, there's a didn't say please. And then I think the plan is just to cast a borrower instead of bouncing anything first. So my opponent mills me for a bunch. Borrower dies, but I get to play another one. And now I get to resolve a couple winged words if I want to. Opponent is down to 10, so it doesn't take much to win here. Was hoping for a banner, but another... Borrower's nice. So yeah, let's attack for four. And again, I could main phase a Borrower or just play Warden. Question is, should I be playing around Cry of the Carnarium or a potential Ritual of Soot here from my opponents? They do have quite a bit of black mana. If they're playing Castle, they should have enough black mana to support a card like Cry or a Ritual which makes it more likely. I still have 33 cards remaining, so I'm not really in a hurry. Yeah, I think I'll just go for the end of turn borrower, even though that does potentially run into a counter spell. Mystic Sanctuary to put a card back on top, it's pretty good. Goes for Drown in the Lock, which is just a hard counter or removal spell. And a Vantress Gargoyle, now that's potentially an issue, as that could block my creatures. Now it doesn't block currently since my opponent only has one card left. If they have an into the story to refuel then it could actually block. But uh, that will resolve. So I'm down to 31 cards. And I think I'm still just gonna cast the borrower here. And if they're out of answers this would be lethal. And then the dungeon guys can maybe tap down the gargoyle if I want to. Alright, they had their own borrower to bounce mine. So, their borrower isn't in play yet. Otherwise I would maybe tap it down with the Geists. I want to save the Geists to tap down their borrower. Instead of tapping down Gargoyle, which can block at the moment, since it's going to require four cards in hand. So I could instead Winged Words in the hopes of finding a banner, which would win on the spot. 
And then I can still go for the end of turn borrower. And no banner. I could play warden, but that doesn't let me play anything else at the moment. So let's attack for four. There's no real difference between uh, playing the borrower at instant speed and getting it killed by the drown or getting it countered by the drown. But this gives him a bit less information. Alright, so they're gonna kill the borrower. That works. And attack for the win. Alright, sweet. So we managed to beat Blue Black Mill. As we could see, the Mono Blue deck definitely can uh, win some games. It is soft to opposing aggro decks, especially Mono Red decks. Are going to have a pretty good matchup against us since they're still going to be faster than we are and our deck's not very good at blocking. But we're definitely capable of beating slower decks. Even an army of zombie tokens from Field of the Dead and the Golos can't stop our flyers. And we have just enough interaction for Hydroid Crisis so our flyers can keep attacking. And then once you're done upgrading this deck, you can still take it in two different directions. You could add white to introduce cards like Empyrean Eagle and Sephara if you like the flying tribal aspect of the deck. Or you could add green and turn this into a blue green flash deck with night pack ambushers and more counter spells if instead you prefer the flash creatures and counter spell aspect of the deck so as you can see there's a lot of ways to keep updating the deck and uh, yeah that's gonna be it for me today feel free to let me know in the comments which deck we should upgrade next as we try to upgrade to one deck per week but for now i want to thank you for watching hope you enjoyed and as always have a nice day I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.